Hello and welcome back to Rage Gaming Videos. My name is Hollow, and today we've got a little bit of a fun video for you. I've got 15 things that are either going to be very useful or very interesting or peculiar to see. Mechanics and interactions you might not be aware of that can benefit you or are just interesting. So without any further ado, let's jump in. Lieutenant the Albanoric has a interesting storyline as a NPC in Elden Ring and she becomes a summon. These Albanoric women cannot walk and cannot move so we find them in the consecrated snowfield area the west side of the mountaintops of the giants and they rove around here with wolves riding them i guess they ride them to get past the fact that they cannot move as a summon she's pretty cool with the bow and obviously able to shoot enemies with her bow but she cannot move but what if we could help her by giving her a wolf to ride here at the carrier manor are some dire wolves that would work but we need to draw them to where we can actually summon, like here, as we approach the boss of this area. So I'm going to draw one over here and then summon her. Oh, it happened instantly. Oh, hell yeah. Okay, so there you can, you can see she is, in fact, riding the wolf. <laughs> That's so cool. But they're fighting still. That's the thing. They are fighting one another. It's not her mount now. They're not allies, which is kind of lame. She is just shooting it in the back of the head. This happens due to, I believe, an error with the coding or like the AI. Um, these dire wolves and these um, female Albanorix, the females will ride the, the wolves. And when you dismount them by doing damage, they will remount after a period. And that's what we're seeing there with that clippy animation. It is happening, that, that, that remount that's meant to happen with enemy AI. So she's getting a mount, but it's still an enemy, so she's still going to kill it, which is a damn shame. But a really cool and unique interaction you might not have known about. The Lazuli Glintstone Sword is an interesting weapon because it comes with the Glintstone Pebble Ash of War. I've even made a whole video about this. It's an incredible Ash of War where you throw a little magic pebble and you can fall it with an R2 and do big damage. It can do a lot of damage and I was doing PvP with that, but unfortunately we found that running the Ash of War with int scaling on the weapon was just better damage overall than using this sword. Which is a shame because it's a really cool looking sword and obviously very effective Ash of War. As you can see per the description, it is actually made of wood this weapon. So yes, you can obviously block with this sword and you can do this Ash of War, kind of cool design, but did you know that you can block while attacking with this weapon? It's one of the only weapons that can actually do this. So if you do a heavy attack, you actually guard then attack. Let me show you. So we're guarding normally. We're blocking. You can see I took a little bit of damage there all the same. And again, and it consumes a bit of my stamina to do so. But let me try and block with an R2 at the same time. There you go. So it still blocks. And the block lasts a long time, as you can see. It's pretty cool. There's not many weapons in this game that can block and attack at the same time. Usually you'd be using a shield and maybe using a spear or like a thrusting weapon behind the block. But with this weapon, you can literally heavy attack and block at the same time, which is pretty cool. Here's a weird one for you. I'm wearing a talisman, right? The Taker's Cameo Talisman. This restores health when you defeat an enemy, right? So lifesteal, basically. We can get effects like this from, say, Riker's weapon, the Blasphemous Blade, or we can get it from the talisman. But what's quite interesting is that it works with bloodstains. Check this out. So there's a guy on the horse here. I have a little bit of health missing, as you can see. I'm just wearing the talisman, nothing else that's going to give me lifesteal. When he dies, I get health back. And so I can activate the bloodstain again instantly, watch him die again as he falls down, and I get health back. So technically, if you are low on health and you don't feel like using a flask, you could just pop this talisman on and watch someone die over and over and over and just get some health back. Now, one thing that's very important to note is that this only works with torrent riders. So you need to find someone who fell while riding their horse. It seems to treat torrent like, uh, you know, a dying enemy or whatever that can give you the health back. But if you watch a regular bloodstain, just a regular guy dying, it won't work. It has to be someone riding torrent. Here's one for you. Did you know you could actually kill these chariots? There's a few different ways. In the Fringe Folk Heroes Grave, where I'm standing now, is where you're going to find one of your first chariot dungeons. Uh, and as we drop down the bridge below and begin to make our way to the secret area, instead of progressing forward to where you get the Erdtree's Favor Talisman, very good talisman, and fight the uh, enemy that drops down, we're actually going to drop down under this bridge instead, drop down another level into this horrible rot pile. 
And on our left, as we drop down here, is the stairway back up. And it has an elevator that you can call using a uh, lever, so let's do that. And at the top of the elevator, as we come up here, we can hear the chariot again. We will have an enemy up here we may want to clear out, make this easier for ourselves. But where we killed that enemy, what you can see right here are some pots hanging in the air. Isn't that interesting? As we hear it near us now, we're going to fire the shot, drop the pot, and there we go. Dead chariot. And they actually drop items. This one drops the Erd Tree Great Bow, and there's a way to get a full armor set. Here in the Azura Hero's Grave, we have another set of chariots. This one is much worse than the first one, though. There's more chariots and a lot harder deal to deal with to get through here. But all we have to do is actually activate something, and it will kill all of the chariots and reward us with an armor set. So we're going to do that. As we come past the Basilisk, then, we're going to have the first two sets of chariots at once. So I'm going to have to very carefully position myself to not get hit by these. Weaving left and right. And as we get to the bottom here, we have a very scary moment where you're dealing with three at once. So we're going to cross over. This one's going to come down, turn around. That one's going to come down, turn around. Let them get out of the way. And there we go. So not too bad. But immediately we're going to drop off the side here to a secret area. This whole uh, rafters bit. Carefully dropping down without falling too far or missing one of these drops. There we go. As we turn to our side here, there is a way out of here with a delightful skeleton companion in my way. Not concerning at all. Let's climb up the ladder behind that skeleton though. And just beyond that ladder that we climbed, we have another ramp with another chariot going up and down. This time, instead of going down, we're going to actually turn around and come up as it comes by us again. So we're going to turn around and go up. And then there's an alcove on our right, just in here and something to hit. So as we hit this, it's going to raise up and it's going to, well, it's going to do something at the top. Uh, we can now go back to the beginning of the dungeon uh, and I probably recommend just dying to do that quickly. And as we come past the Basilisk once again, something different's going to happen this time. As we turn the corner and take a look at the chariots that are spawning in, this one's just going to die because they're going to collide with each other. We've created a new spawn point and they've just collided with one another. As you can see, with the third collision, we get an Ash of War and we also get the full tree sentinel armor set, which is very cool. This is definitely one of the nicest looking armor sets in the game. 100% all my favorites. The cape is wonderful and the armor set itself is really detailed. Speaking of those chariots though, I have a little tip for you in regards to dealing with them a little easier. The Ash of War I have equipped is Raptor of the Mist, which provides you with iframes. You do a little jump when you take a hit. If you use it against a chariot who is about to crush you wholesale, you jump through it. All right, so it's coming behind me. I'm not going to look. I'm not going to look. Now. Yeah. <laughs> so it can obviously make bypassing and getting through these chariot dungeons significantly easier, right? And then our other Ash of War to bypass awkward things with mobility is, of course, Bloodhound Step. When we're walking very slowly in these really horrible knee-high scallop rots or poison swamps, uh, it's a problem. You can't sprint. What you can do, actually, is backstep to move quicker through this type of area if you don't have an Ash of War like this, facing backwards and just spamming the roll button to do so. But it's obviously a lot easier if you have something like Bloodhound Step, where you can absolutely just fly through these areas, and it's no issue at all. The movement penalty is completely removed, and of course, it's going to cost you FP to do, but it is well worth it, as you can see. It's just so much easier to deal with all of this than uh, do it normally. So here's a really good tip for when you're dealing with undead enemies or those that live in death. An obvious example of that would be a skeleton enemy. Skeleton enemies can be quite annoying because when you kill them, they don't die. Unless you hit them a second time when they're like reviving and then that kills them fully. That can be a problem when you're dealing with a lot of them. So dealing with these enemies in a more effective way is of course going to help us. Like, for example, using holy damage against them. So I'm going to fire some holy arrows at this guy. This is a completely unupgraded bow, so forgive the damage. But as you can see, he completely evaporates when killed with holy damage. This works with any source of holy damage. That could be arrows like I just used. This could be holy pots, which does bonus damage to undead enemies, as you can see. But when we land the killing blow, once again, he's not going to revive. And of course... More obviously, you could even use holy incantations to do the same thing. But if you're ever against an undead enemy, a skeleton, or those that live in death, 
Use holy damage if you can. You're going to do way more damage and they are not going to revive. Next, I want to talk about fall damage because it's kind of strange in Elden Ring. Sometimes you look like you're going to be fine and you just straight die. Sometimes you're like, well, this is definitely going to kill me and you just take a bit of damage. It seems kind of random how much you take and whether or not you're going to survive but there is a little thing you can do to prevent fall damage in certain areas in quite a lot of places there's going to be ledges where if you fell you dot you die but there are enemies that can grab you and if you didn't know when you take grab damage you cannot take fall damage as you can see as this enemy is grabbing me, I took no fall damage. He took it all for me. What a nice guy. Obviously, I took the grab damage, but yeah, a worthy price to pay to skip certain areas. There's a few places in the Halig tree where this could be crazy. And obviously here at the Raya Lucari Academy, this is a great skip that speedrunners use to get to the wheel faster. Speaking of skips, we're now gonna talk about the stake skips, which are incredibly useful and I don't see being removed from the game because it is just a clever use of an in-game mechanic. Marika stakes, what they do is when you're near them, you can choose to revive at a Marika stake instead of reviving at a grace, at the last grace you're at, which could really help you at certain boss fights right but what you can also do is use them to bypass huge time constraints or walls of progression so here in the east side of Kaelid we of course have the Radan fight the great rune fight and normally you have to make your way through the castle fight a bunch of stuff make your way all the way here and eventually begin the festival with Radan or you could just come to the church of plague like I've done run along the side here eventually coming to this pillar you're going to jump up on top of the pillar. Then we're gonna jump off the pillar and double jump. And we're basically gonna make sure we land on the sand itself rather than anywhere else. And what you're gonna see is instead of the last sight of grace I'm being forced to respawn at, I can choose the nearest stake, which just so happens to be the Radan revive stake if you die in the Radan fight, which is right here. So what I can literally do and do do in new playthroughs is completely avoid Redmain Castle and all of that. And I just go up there and jump off the side and hey, I'm at the Redan fight much faster. Or there's an even better one for huge progression in a playthrough. We're here at the mountaintops of the Giants, right, on the east side. And then you have the secret area um, of the consecrated snow field. We can do the same thing by skipping all of that go get the medallion stuff to actually unlock this area by doing a stake skip. So here from the ancient snow valley ruins grace from the main progression of this area. As we get to this frozen river, we're going to take a left turn and run down west just past the shack of the lofty and come to the edge here. Now as we reach the shack on our right, uh, there's going to be these two rocks we're going to run between. We're going to jump off here and double jump just like we did last time. In this case, we're going to try to aim as far forward and to the right as possible because we don't want to hit any of the rocks on the way down. We want to hit the ground in the snowfield. So the game thinks you're in the snowfield and it's going to ask you if you want to revive at the Marika Stake in the snowfield. This is a huge time save and very convenient to know about. This one goes out to my curved sword bros. If you've played any of the other games, if you've ever used a curved sword, you probably know about the flip. Uh, in the old games, you used to be able to kick like so just by using a light attack and taking a step forward. So if I try and do that now, that's been removed. So in the same way, if I try and do the same thing with a curved sword, there is no kick and there's no backflip, which is kind of a shame. So yes, you can still kick by having your fists out and pressing L2. It's just now an ash of war, but anyone can do it at any time because you just go fists and then you can kick. Very cool. And the backflip is still in the game. What you need to do now to do it is do a heavy attack and then press B to backstep during the heavy attack and then you'll do the flip. This is pretty cool because in PvE you're going to be able to use it to reposition in the middle of a fight while also doing an attack. And the same in PvP, you can catch people out with this or do an attack and evade backwards to space out the trade. We can do this with any curved sword that has the curved sword heavy attack which is uh, quite a lot of them, obviously. And it is a cool little trick you can do if you're unaware of it and using a curved sword. Okay, so this is technically useful, but more than anything, it's just dumb. Did you know you can block lava? It's actually been a thing in the Soul series for a long time, but we did, I, I don't know, I just didn't think it would make it to Elden Ring. And as it turns out, it, it, it did. Uh, so as you can see, this is the amount of damage I take while standing in lava, a reasonable chunk. And when I start blocking, it's not going to reduce the damage unless I turn the correct way. So as you can see, now that I'm facing this direction, which is what, southwest, 
I am now taking significantly less fire damage while standing in the lava. If I face this way, the same thing. So if I'm facing, what is this, true south? Let's try east. And there we go. So once I start facing east, I start taking fire damage or lava damage again in full. North side, again, still taking the same damage. So yes, if you want to stop taking lava damage, or rather reduce the amount that you take, you need to face kind of south, southeast, true south or southwest, and then block with a shield, and it will greatly reduce the damage you take while in lava. But at the same time, lava does nothing in this game. I've never seen it so weak in a Souls game. I'm so confused. Here's one that I thought was common knowledge, but it turns out it isn't based on the comments on my recent speedrunning video where I basically offhandedly mentioned it and people didn't know about it. So if you open up the map, you can do a few things. We could press LB or L1, and that will reveal where current online play is happening. But more importantly, we can press triangle or why and this opens up your list of sites of grace so these are the lists of sites of grace in limgrave i can easily swap between and there's tabs for all of them so if i want all the ones in stoneville castle or in the lakes maybe i want to quickly go to like uh, the deep root depths i can do that you know i can like go over here at the halig tree much faster there's also another thing you can do using this feature which is really nice and i definitely recommend i end up at the gate front quite a lot for these videos uh, just to showcase certain things so naturally it would be convenient for me if i could fast teleport here easily well i can while i've got this list up open all the different locations i can press the right stick in over any site of grace and that will mark it that will favor it as you can see it's got a star next to it now then i can press triangle or y again to go to my marked site of grace list now i've marked a few let's go to my marked list and as you can see, I've got the Giant's Grave post here, Volcano Manor, the Four Belfries, and then of course the Gatefront. And I can easily quickly teleport to any of these in these different regions super quickly. Or, I mean, technically what I could do is I could go to the Giant's Grave post, right? Now I'm hovering over this area and I pull out that menu and I can go over here. I want to look at something in Limgrave super quick. Well, then I'll pull up that quickly that menu, go to the Gatefront. Now I'm looking at Limgrave and I can move around and pick one of these graces. It's just convenient. Now I have a couple tips to do with lightning, fire, and the weather. When it is raining like it is now, did you know that your lightning attacks, any source of lightning in fact, is going to do increased damage because it is raining. But your fire attacks, they're going to do reduced damage because yeah, it's raining. It's kind of a subtle detail, but it's important to be aware of. Uh, that the weather can actually affect your damage. And as a follow-up to that, I want to talk about lightning in the water or any electricity type of attack, I suppose. So yeah, you use it normally, it's going to do its normal thing. Going to go whatever you use into the enemy, great. But did you know that if you strike lightning into water like this lake here, it will ripple out in an AoE dealing AoE damage? Here's a really cool effect. The Cursed Blood Pot. If you throw this at an enemy, it will douse them in a cursed blood, and that causes your summons to specifically attack them with, quote, rabid fervor. Meaning, if I throw this pot at a target, my summons are going to specifically target that enemy. So let's give it a try in a pack of enemies where there's a lot of targets, but we want to focus down one specific one. So they're currently fighting a dog right now. Let's go ahead and throw a pot at this guy and see what they do. They're going to stop attacking the dog completely, entirely ignoring it, running straight over to the guy that's been hit by the accursed blood, and they're immediately going to start bombarding him. You can also see that they have this effect, sort of a red glow around them, to show that they're affected by this, and they're in that frenzied state. I've even heard that this gives them increased attack speed, but I don't know, they seem to have the same attacks as normal. It's just they're focused on a target. So technically they're going to attack it with more fervor, focus it down, maybe deal more damage quicker because of that, because you're controlling their AI in a way. But I don't know that it gives them actual attack speed. Still, extremely useful in any fight where there's multiple targets, you want to control your summon or summons more specifically. But there you have it. Those are my 15, or actually more than 15, things that I found interesting or even useful to know about in Elden Ring. There are so many unique interactions or strange things that might not even be attended that do happen in this game. So if you do know any, drop it in the comments and we could come back with another. For now though, I've been Hollow and you've been you. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next time. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice
to reiterate that it is nice to look into your faces on a mostly daily basis when you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage is uh goodbye <laughs>